we're going to get started. And in our new tradition, I'm going to do a very brief uh, introduction to Dr. Tom McAllister, who's our uh, distinguished visiting lecturer today. So uh, Dr. McAllister is the Albert Eugene Stern Professor and Chair at Indiana University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. He previously was the Millennial Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology and Director of Psych Neuropsychiatry at, uh, at Dartmouth School of Medicine, where actually that's his alma mater. That's where he went undergraduate and, and medical school, correct? Um, and then he did a stint in Kentucky where he learned about bourbon, horse racing, and basketball. Uh, none of which he liked before, but now he likes. Uh, and then he went to Penn, which actually I met Tom because I was a medical student at Penn and he was my attending. Um, and little did we know, here we are again. Um, and then he, um, after Penn, he went back to Dartmouth and now he's at IU. So um, Tom is a, is a uh, renowned expert on TBI and that's what he's going to talk to us about today, particularly around uh, sports concussion. And it's, it's a very timely topic. There was another... Every day there's something. There was another thing today in the New York Times, that, un unfortunately. So um, I, we have a lot to learn, and, and uh, we're in the middle of, I think, um, as Tom and I were talking last night, a really fascinating, evolving story. So we're looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Christine. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here and um, see your great facility. And... Um, learn about it. So we're going to dive right in because I hear we're on a, uh, on a tight time frame and uh, we want to get done. So um, sadly, uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, uh, I, uh, some of the work that I'll talk about is supported by grants from the um, U.S. Department of Defense and from the uh, uh, NCAA. Um, it's a, the CARE Consortium, which I'll talk a little bit about. But let me start off by just uh, answering the burning question, why are we having a um, um, talk on TBI? Uh, so I'm on the lavalier, but we can turn up the volume. Yeah, is that better? Okay. Um, so why are we having a talk about TBI and sport-related concussion uh, in a psychiatry uh, venue? And I think part of the reason is listed here. If you look at um, multiple studies, uh, the relative risk of developing a psychiatric illness after a traumatic brain injury, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, uh, goes way up, and it's been um, uh, estimated that some three-quarters of people with a brain injury will develop a psychiatric illness in the five years um, after the injury, and about half of those, uh, they will be uh, new disorders, so de novo. Um, the, the rest of them may have uh, brought uh, the illness into the uh, injury with them. So it's almost as if TBI is the sort of uh, gateway uh, event uh, to certain types of, um, of psychopathology. So it's worth knowing a little uh, something about that just from that perspective. Um, like other conditions, there's a uh, spectrum of severity. Um, I've circled the um, mild end of the spectrum, which is what we will be uh, talking about. Dear heavens, all right, here we go. Uh, talking about uh, today, usually the severity um, parameters are loss of consciousness and its duration. Um, whether or not you had post-traumatic amnesia, and if somebody happened to be there and give you a Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, what the score on that, uh, on that instrument was, assuming that they actually knew how to do it properly, which is always a big thing. So we're going to be focused on mild TBI, and this end of the spectrum, that means that if you had loss of consciousness, uh, you regained consciousness within 30 minutes. If you had post-traumatic amnesia, it had resolved by 24 hours. And um, the Glasgow Coma Scale score would be 13 to 15. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I would not like to be unconscious for 30 minutes and then be told that I had a mild injury to me. That wouldn't feel particularly mild. So there are some problems with this, with this labeling. But nevertheless, uh, this is the convention. And one might argue that the um, sport-related concussion, which we'll begin to focus on, is actually at the mild end of the mild spectrum. Um, and in fact, in the past, there was a lot of uh, discussion about whether concussion, about terminology, about whether concussion actually meant mild TBI, was it something else? Um, and uh, Christine and I were talking about uh, this last night. TBI has uh, uh, grown several different tribes of people who uh, are seeing it from different perspectives, and one was the sports medicine community, and they were quite convinced initially that this was not a traumatic brain injury. Millions of dollars have actually been spent on defining TBI and all sorts of consensus work groups and crazy. But 
and there are lots of schemes. The bottom line is that they all have something uh, uh, at their core, which is you have to have some kind of force acting on the brain. And as a result of that force, it results in some sort of alteration in the level of consciousness and disruption of neurological function, usually manifested by incomplete memory, uh, confusion, being dazed and confused for what that's worth, uh, and so forth. And finally, it took them five consensus conferences, but the International Consensus Conference on Sports uh, Concussion uh, finally agreed that sport-related concussion is a traumatic injury induced by biomechanical forces caused either by a direct blow to the head, uh, face, neck, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, we have agreement that when we talk about sport-related concussion, we're talking about a mild brain injury. It may be, as I said, on the milder end of the mild spectrum, but nevertheless. And what that does is that gives us a framework for thinking about these different events um, that people are exposed to, sometimes on a fairly uh, regular basis. Now, in addition to um, uh, thinking in terms of, of the relative risk of psychiatric illness, it turns out that, from my perspective, being a somewhat biased one as a neuropsychiatrist, concussion is a neuropsychiatric um, syndrome. I recognize that some of you may not see a lot of folks with acute concussion, but basically, um, or mild traumatic brain injury, but basically, there are three clusters uh, of symptoms generally. One um, is um, cognitive, so people report I'm having problems with memory, I can't uh, pay attention the way I could, I'm thinking more slowly, etc. Another cluster is um, uh, somatic symptoms, for lack of a better term, so things like headache, uh, disequilibrium, dizziness, and the like. And then the third cluster is uh, mood and affective kinds of uh, things. So people will report uh, being depressed, being slowed down, being fatigued, being uh, anxious, um, and a whole host of other symptoms that... If you didn't know what you were talking about, you might think, wow, this is taken directly from the Hamilton Anxiety Scale or the Hamilton Depression Scale or the back depression in the brain. In fact, what I've put here is the SCAT-5, which is the um, uh, assessment for concussion assessment tool, the standard concussion assessment tool, um, which includes, it's, it's the most widely used sort of measure of, or assessment instrument for um, sports medicine and for people, coaches, athletic trainers, so it has a 22-item uh, checklist, and what I've um, been circled there is that about two-thirds of the symptoms that are uh, being assessed there have to do with mood, anxiety, fatigue, and other aspects. This is a neuropsychiatric uh, event, and I think that's why you all in the audience have a lot to add to the assessment, treatment, and uh, research. Uh, for this topic, because at its heart, um, that's my view of what it is. Now, millions of dollars, lots of groups defining uh, what it is, um, and sometimes, um, rather than defining it, um, uh, it's just easier to see it. And uh, as um, um, a very famous uh, Supreme Court judge, uh, Potter Stewart, uh, opined about obscenity and pornography, it's hard to define, but I know it when I see it. So I'm going to show you uh, one of these events, if I can figure out now how to... Uh, okay. We had them embedded successfully, but they're not now, so just bear with me for a second. Stars Sharks playing each other for the second time in a week, and they hate each other. Grant Marshall, they hit on Owen Nolan. Shark players don't like that hit. Late in the first, Owen Nolan gets his revenge. Nolan hat-racking Marshall. Sucker punches him. Marshall goes down. Then Marshall, take another look. Here it is. He was just heading to the bench, folks. Nolan will get a game misconduct. As for Marshall, not good. You know what happened to him? He had to leave the ice on a strip. So I think most of us would agree that something bad happened there, um, that there was a at least temporary uh, disruption of neurological function, that it was caused by a force uh, acting on the brain, and that if it were you, you probably wouldn't want that happening to you too often. Uh, now, that's a rather dramatic one. I will tell you that I show this uh, clip a lot, um, and every time I see it, I still wince and just go, oh, my God. Now, Here's the question for you, because it's going to um, uh, illustrate some points that we'll make later in the talk. So how many um, uh, head impacts were there? Was there one? Two? Three? Yeah, there were at least three. 
So there was the direct to the head, then there was the head uh, on the ice, and then there was the head on the ice part deux, um, where he bounced uh, back on the ice again. And at its heart there, it clarifies for you why some of the stuff that we'll talk about later about how to uh, think about the biomechanics of this injury and uh, um, whether being hit once or 20 times is uh, too much or too little. Um, this is a complicated area to try and um, uh, make sense out of, but we will um, uh, we'll do our best. So back to the, um, the talk, the rest of the talk. Sorry, I will have to back, uh, go back and forth like this a couple of times, but we'll, we'll make do. So, as Christine mentioned at the outset, um, this kind of event uh, has gotten all sorts of attention uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. It's very difficult to open up uh, a paper or watch Sports Center or uh, go online, uh, wherever your news source happens to be, and escape um, uh, some sort of uh, discussion about uh, brain injury and in particular about sport-related concussion. And obviously even there was a, a, a dramatic movie in which Will Smith played uh, uh, Bennett Omalu and more on him uh, to follow. Um, this is really a changing paradigm. When I got into the field uh, a long time ago and gave a talk on this, no one would come. Uh, because no one cared. The idea was that mild brain injury and sport-related concussion in particular was a non-event. Um, it had uh, uniformly good prognosis. We used terms like getting your bell rung, a ding, uh, seeing stars, and so forth. I have a whole other talk that would be fun to give at some point on how mild TBI was treated in the media and in movies and, and so forth uh, over time. It's a joke. You know, the cartoons, the Looney Tune, uh, where you see blah, blah, blah. So um, at some point this changed, and it changed uh, first uh, with the idea that, well, yeah, for the most part this is a good prognosis event, but there's some people who um, may not uh, have a good outcome. Boxers, uh, people who are professional boxers who are getting knocked out on a repetitive basis and are engaging in, uh, you know, a sport in which the point is to knock you out. Um, and that was the uh, <laughs> publication in the 1920s of uh, the neuropathology of dementia pugilistica or punch drunk syndrome. And it was thought, okay, fine, you know, if you're going to be a boxer, then you're going to assume the risk, and of course, you know, it shouldn't be. Um, and then um, it, we have evolved from that to a concern that it's not really an event, um, but it's the initiation of a chronic, debilitating neurodegenerative process. I'm not saying that's what it is, I'm saying that the perception out there. In the narrative around sport-related concussion has changed dramatically uh, over the last um, decade or so. And the idea is that uh, perhaps even uh, a single event uh, initiates a chronic cascade of neurodegenerative events uh, culminating in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE which is depicted in some of Anne McKee's slides on the right where the dark brown ugly looking stuff are um, excessive and abnormal depositions of tau uh, in particular strategic areas um, of the brain. But it's not just in professional, it's, it's, so it was recoined, it was returned from um, dementia pugilistic because Bennett O'Malo found this in a football player, well we can't call it boxer's disease, so we're going to call it something else, so we're going to call it chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. Um, but it wasn't just in athletes anymore, so the narrative has changed to a point where there's increasing concerns across the entire lifespan. In fact, this is a quote from Bennett O'Malo uh, that appeared in the New York uh, Times. If a child who plays football is subjected to advanced radiological and neurocognitive studies during the season and several months after the season, there can be evidence of brain damage at the cellular level of brain functioning, even if there were no documented concussions or reported symptoms. Over many seasons, these cellular injuries accumulate to cause irreversible brain damage, which we now know by the name CTE, a disease that I, Bennett, first diagnosed in 2002. So a couple of things. I'm not aware of those studies uh, that have been done. In fact, I'm pretty sure none of those studies have been done in young children. So, um, you know, take that uh, um, for what it is. It was 
um, uh, published in the New York Times, so maybe it's fake news. I'll let you uh, decide uh, how, you, how, you, how you view that. But the point is more that this is the narrative that is getting uh, embedded in, in the public's mind. And to the point that um, it is having an impact on people's decision making with respect to their kids. So there's a significant drop off in participation in uh, youth football and in high school football. And uh, this is from the Chicago Tribune down here. Another um, quote uh, of interest, Dr. Ben Romalo, the forensic pathologist, whose discovery of CTD was chronicled in the 2015 movie Concussion, recently told an audience at the New York Press Club that telling kids under 18 to play football is the definition of child abuse. So any of you here uh, had kids that played football? I'm going to report you to uh, DCS. Um, <laughs> you're, in, you're in big trouble now. So what do we make of this? Um, if it's true, then we have a fairly significant problem because the epidemiology of sport-related concussion is such that uh, there are millions of these uh, each year. This is estimates from old estimates from the CDC. The point about this, it's millions, and this is a big underestimate because the vast majority of concussions are either not diagnosed or underreported. Um, in part perhaps because of ignorance, so that's becoming harder and harder uh, a case to make, uh, in part because people don't want to um, lose playing time. The motivations are completely different in this arena. And in fact, um, one could think that um, this is a huge public health problem, especially again if we go back to the New York Times. This is a uh, cover um, from the New York Times Magazine a while back in which um, the uh, headline, the banner headline, was that 110 out of 111 uh, retired NFL player brains uh, were found to have CTE, and they chronicled each, uh, pretty much each brain and some of the, the stories that went. This made a big splash and had a big impact, <laughs> no pun, uh, on, on people's thinking about it. The problem is, of course, that... Um, we don't know what about the rest of the brains of the people um, that uh, died and did not donate their brain to Ann McKee's lab uh, and so forth. I don't think anybody would argue that all that tau is ugly, uh, that it's probably not a good thing, um, and that it may well be um, uh, bad for the people who have excessive amounts of it. But the question is, we don't know. We don't know the, the denominator. Now, there was an interesting uh, paper, however, that uh, Benny and Bashinsky published uh, subsequent to that um, that gives us some insight into the parameters, perhaps, about how concerned um, and how big a problem we might have. So basically what they did is they said, okay, so you guys collected these brains, you know, donated by families who had a a vested interest in having an external um, uh, perspective on what might have caused their loved one's uh, neuropsychiatric problems. So they went to the Players Association. So, so how many people died during that same NFL, retired NFL players? How many NFL players died during that same period? And it turns out it was 1,100 and something. And so basically they then um, took a look and said, well, um, what if we uh, estimate the percentage of uh, players uh, who, who, who were NFL players um, uh, with CTE, assuming different probabilities of uh, brain donation um, among the, the group that died. In other words, it's sort of a measure of uh, bias in terms of sample selection. And so at the outset, if all, 100% of everybody who had CTE and died after a career in the NFL donated their brains or their family donated their brains, then we would have 110 out of 1,100 uh, as the denominator, so about 10%. Now, if you um, increase that to, well, let's say, um, you know, 50% of the people that um, uh, had CTE donated their brains, then you get upwards of about 20 to 25, somewhere between 20 and 30%. So bad number, especially if you're an NFL player. Not everybody 
Not everybody. Now, we don't know. This was just a sort of exercise, sort of like power calculations. Um, we're, we're powered to detect this effect size, et cetera. But it was an interesting approach on this, and I think it, it makes the point that later on uh, we'll get back to, which is, so should we be worried about brain in, or uh, head impacts in everybody, or is there a subgroup of people for whom um, hitting your head on a repetitive basis may not be the, uh, the, the best thing? And essentially, um, this goes down to um, our we ahead of the data uh, with respect to both the long-term uh, and dangerous effects of, um, of repetitive concussion and repetitive head impacts and you know let you guys decide by the end of uh, the lecture I think it's an open question I think this is a fascinating time to be uh, engaged in this field uh, because of all the attention and because of the fact that we're delving into biomechanics of brain injury which in essence is greatly increasing the relative risk of developing psychiatric illness. So we are actually down at the level of trying to figure out um, which brain regions impacted in which way might be the gateway to um, uh, um, some, of, some of the psychopathology. And it turns out there are lots of other fundamental questions that we don't know. So who gets a concussion? Uh, we really don't have a whole lot of information on that. What are the neural mechanisms uh, involving concussion? People talk that it's uh, white matter injury and diffuse axonal injury. Uh, maybe. Um, uh, let's look at the, at the proof of that. Um, is it an event, an exposure, an illness? Who gets better and who has persistent effects? That's one of the enduring mysteries. And it's not just in sport-related concussion. It's in mild traumatic brain injury. This controversy goes back um, literally 150 years, um, back to railroad spine and other kinds of, uh, of injuries in which people just couldn't understand why some people with seemingly the same injury it was a non-event, and others, they were disabled uh, for life. So what are the determinants of that? Um, how many concussions or how many repetitive head impacts is too many? We don't know that. And is concussion the proper uh, marker? Uh, so since it's so underreported, should we uh, actually be paying attention more to um, repetitive head impacts and counting how many people have and therefore cutting them off, sort of like a pitch count um, in, in Little League or, or in uh, Major League Baseball. Now, we do know some things. Uh, we know that if you want to uh, avoid uh, concussion or you want to lower your risk of concussion, um, it's best to avoid collision sports. So these are, um, <laughs> yeah, this is not rocket science, really. Um, but these are rates of uh, concussion in football, uh, men's lacrosse, and wrestling, the sort of uh, paradigmatic um, uh, collision sports of the top line, uh, contact sports, in which contact is a pretty regular part of the game, but the intent is not to collide. Um, so sports like soccer, girls lacrosse, um, field hockey, and so forth. And uh, incidental contact, so softball, basketball, and cheerleading, which actually cheerleading has a very high rate of concussion because of the gym, gymnastics as, uh, with that and the fact that they're doing it on really hard floors. Uh, and so when you fall from that height, um, you're likely to get injured. We know that um, concussion rates differ uh, um, with sex. So basically, um, if you look at sports in which men and women uh, play the same uh, sports, the relative risk uh, is higher in women. We don't know why that is, uh, but sports like basketball, soccer, and softball and baseball. Lots of theories about it. We don't know that. Why don't we know that? Well, the reason is that 99% of the studies on concussion were done in what? male football players. So uh, at this point in time, the largest study of uh, women with concussion is probably uh, under 50, um, I would venture to say. So we don't have a lot of information that's changing. We'll get to that. We know that um, there is variability in concussion threshold. So this is from a study that we uh, um, did with the CARE Consortium, which stands for Concussion Assessment Research and Evaluation. Um, had to come up with one of those gimmicky titles, you know. Um, and we looked at um, biomechanical input um, related to um, uh, concussion. And what we found uh, is that uh, linear acceleration varied anywhere from 54 Gs, which is the standard uh, way of uh, quantifying um, um, uh, impact magnitude to 94, almost a factor of two. Um, so some people were getting diagnosed with 50G hit, some people were getting diagnosed with concussion, a 94G hit. 
and this is similar kind of range for rotational accelerations, which is where the head is spinning on its axis and is thought to be actually more detrimental. The other thing is that, or what that doesn't show though, is that for all of these that were uh, diagnosed with a concussion at either 54 or 94, there are hundreds if not thousands of other impacts that are occurring within that range in which people were not diagnosed with a concussion. So you can take 100 people and give them a 54G impact, and the vast majority of them will not be diagnosed with a concussion after. If you give 100 people uh, 94 Gs, you have a much higher percentage, but you have by no means all of them. So what is that about? Does that mean that uh, my brain is more sensitive to uh, the similar kind of impact than yours is? Maybe. Um, we don't know. What we do know, though, is that in this study, almost half of those that were diagnosed uh, with concussion um, were the highest impact that they had sustained over the season. So if you were somebody who was poking along getting the median 20G impact for the football season and all of a sudden you got a 45G impact, you were much more likely to uh, be diagnosed with a concussion than somebody who was getting all sorts of high impact hits um, for, the, for the season up until now. So how do, we, how do we think about that? Maybe it's individual threshold um, and people, um, if we could determine that, we could recommend to parents, um, well, rather than abusing your child, maybe you ought to encourage them to join the uh, chess club or to uh, become swimmers or what have you. But we're a long way from that. We know that there's an interaction between concussive and so-called non-concussive impacts. And I, I really encourage people not to use sub-concussive or, or non-concussive impacts. Just call it what it is, a repetitive head impact. It's a head impact. We can't define what a concussive impact is, so I'm not sure what a sub-concussive impact is. And so it's a, sort of one of these terminologist things. But here's what was it. This was from a study that we did earlier uh, before the CARE Consortium. Again, it was a consortium of schools, football players, and ice hockey players. And asked a very simple question of the people who were diagnosed with a concussion. Let's look at um, the impacts that they had um, on the day that they were diagnosed with a concussion and compare it to the impacts that they had on days that they were not diagnosed with a concussion. And it turns out that on days in which a concussion was diagnosed, they were getting hit much more frequently and they were getting harder hits uh, in that time frame, raising the question that is there a context that matters? It does in most things, right? So why wouldn't it be concussion? So is it possible that it's not just a single blow, but think back to the video that you saw in which you had three hits, right, um, one after the other. Um, maybe that's the kind of um, um, impact or series of impacts that is going to be more important to determining whether you end up being diagnosed uh, with a concussion. What about repetitive impacts or concussions? So this is just uh, um, data which uh, is not from ours, this is from Mickey Collins group. And basically what you're seeing here is that um, on the left are sort of uh, severity indicators of how severe the concussion is. So the fact that you lost consciousness, you have retrograde amnesia, confusion, et cetera, et cetera. And this is uh, your uh, relative risk of having one of those more, uh, one of those more severe indicators if you've already had three or more uh, concussions in the past. And it turns out that, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it turns out that um, the relative risk of uh, having a more severe concussion goes up with higher concussion. This is what we see clinically actually fairly commonly. So if you talk with athletes, it appears as though there's a tipping point or a threshold where people can absorb a certain number of concussions. My self-report with all the issues and concerns that that raises. But they'll say, yeah, this is my third concussion, and it's taking me a little bit longer to get better, um, and it was more severe, and so forth. And that's probably one of the, I mean, when I'm working with people like that, that's when I tell them that they probably need to start thinking about uh, engaging in a different activity. Um, and it turns out that there's a fair amount of, I shouldn't say that. There is some data which suggests that, that the, um, are you all Monty Python fans by any chance? The three shall be the number. Yeah. <laughs> some of you know the reference. Uh, <laughs> if you have uh, three or more concussions, that seems to be a tipping point uh, for some people that's worth paying attention to. 
In fact, in our care consortium data, uh, three or more, again, this is self-reported, so it, uh, it's hard to know what to make of it, but it's the best we uh, can get. Um, it, it's associated with a higher likelihood of being in a delayed return to play group, a higher likelihood of a longer duration of symptoms, and is associated, interestingly, with higher baseline scores, it's before they even get injured, on the baseline symptom index, a measure of psychological health that most of you are probably um, uh, familiar with. But it's not just the acute, um, it's not just the acute event that um, uh, there seems to be an impact. Um, there's a concussion, there seems to be a concussion dose response relationship uh, to depression. I'm switching now to, uh, again, back to retired NFL players. So that uh, this is a study that Zach Kerr and uh, his group did um, that um, the more self-reported concussions that NFL players had during uh, their uh, career, and it had to be a career of five or more uh, seasons, I believe, uh, the higher the likelihood um, that uh, they had been they had been diagnosed uh, with depression. Well, so okay, uh, maybe an association. And you might not make too much of it, but then you look at this. So this is the National Survey of Children's Health done in 2007. Again, uh, all sorts of methodological issues that you can comment on. But it's a telephone survey of, uh, of parents done by the uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau and the U.S. Uh, health and Human Services, controlling for age, sex, parental mental health, uh, SES, and so forth. And a history of concussion was associated with a uh, over threefold greater risk of current depression. Now there may be all sorts of other variables associated with that. But again, uh, it's a sort of, hmm, um, better be thinking about this. We also know that if you do develop a psychiatric disorder uh, after your concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, you are uh, much more likely to be in the delayed recovery group. Um, and it complicates um, how long it takes uh, for you to be able to either return to play, return to learn, or uh, return um, to duty. But then if you look at some of the larger studies, uh, again, in NFL players, you get a sort of other nuanced kind of version, which is um, these are circled. Some of the larger studies are, are uh, circled uh, in blue, and the Baron and Demon studies are a cohort of over 3,000 uh, retired NFL players. The first one found no increase in mortality due to mental psychoneurotic, since less than you heard that term, uh, and personality uh, disorders. Um, and then they looked at suicide rates, which has, again, uh, gotten a lot of uh, press and publicity in NFL players. And it was lower in that cohort than in the general population. So not saying it's not a problem, just saying that, uh, again, is it a problem for everybody, or do we need to be paying uh, some attention to individual factors and individual differences, which obviously you can tell, I think, my bias. Uh, Zach Kerr's group, again, um, reported the uh, increased risk of depressive illness correlated with the number of concussions that I referenced a couple of slides ago. But um, in that overlapping group, uh, former college, sorry, this is former uh, collegiate athletes were unable to find any difference in concussed mental health uh, composite scores in collision and contact athletes. So a mixed, uh, a mixed bag. And that's just concussion. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, basic um, uh, narrative around this has uh, evolved a little bit from a focus solely on concussion to one of um, repetitive head impacts. And we probably know even less about that than we knew um, about concussion. What's the critical level of impact exposure across uh, sports, gender, age, level of play? Is there a CTE uh, threshold? Um, is there this injury threshold that I mentioned earlier? How good are we at identifying the injury? So is concussion actually the appropriate metric? So uh, this got revolutionized about 15 years ago when um, some uh, colleagues at, at uh, Simbex figured out how to put um, accelerometers and embed them in uh, padding in helmets so that you could actually, and they're in contact with the skin, all sorts of measurement problems related with this, but it's better than what we had before, which is, wow, that looked like a wicked bad uh, hit. Um, and um, 
So basically, you put them in the helmet. You have the uh, players wear it the entire season. Um, we did this in hockey. We also did it in football. Lots of groups are using this. We're using it in the care consortium as well. And you have uh, uh, you end up with a count of how many times you had an impact that exceeded whatever threshold you put. Most people put a 14 G impact as one. And there are all sorts of algorithms for scrubbing out when the kids get mad and throw their helmet on the ground and, and figuring out that that's actually not a concussion and so forth and so on. Um, and it turns out that this has been done in youth football as well. And I wanted to show you that this is not just for NFL and, and uh, high school players, but basically there was two uh, Pop Warner teams, um, uh, so little uh, uh, nine to twelve year olds um, that are being abused by their parents um, and they were recorded and wore those helmets uh, over a couple of seasons and basically they recorded 7,500 uh, impacts a mean of about 170 per kid uh, per season what's interesting is that uh, 500 of them over 500 of them so about eight to ten percent were uh, defined as so-called high uh, magnitude impact, so about uh, greater than 40 G hits. So those are fairly significant. I would not want a 40 G hit. These are little, little kids that are, um, you know, about 10 percent of the time they're getting uh, hit with pretty, pretty big, um, pretty big impacts. So if you extrapolate uh, from studies that are in the literature, this is the exposure that uh, kids who are uh, engaged in football are, are, are uh, experiencing. So about 500 hits over five years of youth football, about 3,000 hits over four years of high school, and 5,000 hits over four years of college. So about 8,500 total uh, over a 13-year amateur career. And then about 1,200 per year is the estimate uh, for uh, NFL players. So a lot of hits, a lot of hits. Now. What we find is that what's the distribution of the magnitude of the hits, the median um, for these, this is based on 184,000 impacts that uh, we recorded uh, across several different schools, is about 20 Gs. So to give you some idea, um, when you walk, you're probably, you know, you're bouncing a little bit like this, and you're getting about probably three or four Gs. Uh, if you have a really vigorous sneeze, you may get up to about eight or nine. Jeez. Remember when the football players used to, they don't do it as much anymore, probably because of this, get together and psych themselves up on the wall. That's about a 15 to 20 G um, hit, okay? So the median is 50. What I want to call your attention to is that um, the 95th percentile is, is north of 60 Gs. This is linear acceleration. But we were recording uh, Gs upwards of over 110, 120, uh, 130 Gs. Don't let this fool you. This is a percentage of 184,000 impacts. So there are actually a fair number of these impacts uh, that are very high, um, very high magnitude. So let me give you a feel. Sorry, going to have to end the show and show you, but I'm going to show you what a uh, uh, this kind of impact looks like, uh, recorded from some of these uh, sensors. I'm going to get rid of him. And I'm going to do this. This has no sound, so you're not missing anything. So watch the receiver. It's coming up right here. Now you'll see it in slow motion. So it's actually two head impacts, not dissimilar to the hockey player. The first is a face-to-face -face impact right there, and that's 128G uh, impact. And then he's probably unconscious and falls to the ground. He doesn't have much uh, motor control there, and his head hits uh, the ground uh, with a 49 uh, G impact as well, within you know half a second uh, of each other. So fairly significant uh, blows there. Now I'm going to show you a different one. And I'm not going to tell you which player it is. I want you to see whether you can identify Anybody see it? Yeah, okay, so now we're going to uh, watch the, the right guard who pulls out uh, on the play. Let's see number uh, 75. It's right there. 
and you can see that he sort of stumbles, um, is dazed, puts his head down, uh, et cetera, and was diagnosed uh, with concussion, and that was a 44G uh, uh, hit. So huge range, um, 128 Gs, 44 Gs, both diagnosed um, uh, ultimately with, uh, with concussion. Let me go back. So the revelations from, uh, oh there, it's trying to load. Okay. Is that A, throughout all youth, all age groups, there are lots of hits. There is no clear concussion threshold. When we started this, we thought, oh, this is going to be fun and easy. We're going to find that at 52 Gs, you have a high likelihood. That's not the case. Um, there are lots of really hard hits without concussion being diagnosed and some um, modest hits, not that I would want them, but modest um, uh, where there isn't uh, a diagnosis. And it's not always clear which impact causes the concussion or that there's a smoking gun associated with this. So. The head impact measurement team from the CARE Consortium that does this for their living <laughs> um, pours through the video after somebody is diagnosed with a concussion and looks very hard to see which was the impact. And part of this is that while I showed you a couple of fairly dramatic ones where you could tell by the individual's behavior um, uh, that something bad had happened and we ought to check it out, probably had a concussion, um, there are lots of about a third of the folks where you just can't identify the smoking gun impact. And the third, a somewhat overlapping third, of people will not even report symptoms until a day or two later. So what will happen is it's game time on Friday night, Friday night lights, or on Saturday at the college level, or Sunday, whatever, and then they'll come in uh, to the training room um, two days later and say, hey, you know, I really didn't feel all that good over the weekend, and well, what did you have? I had a headache, and I just felt a little wobbly, and I blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you go through the, the, the scat, and you end up diagnosing them with a concussion. So are these different phenotypes, the people that report um, immediately versus, and it turns out that um, it matters with respect to how soon you uh, become asymptomatic and how soon you're able to return uh, to play. So it, it, it may matter. So a lot of biomechanical complexity. Uh, and it turns out that you can model this um, using finite element method uh, approaches, which basically you take an MRI, you segment bone, CSF, gray matter, white matter um, to an individual's brain. You uh, assign various uh, material properties to each of the voxels. Uh, so if it's a white matter voxel, you assign it this degree of elasticity and this degree of rigidity. You put it all into um, a voxelized map of the brain. And that allows you to then take the biomechanical trace from the sensor and input it into this model and uh, come out with a topography, if you will, of where the maximum principal strain is in the brain that's associated with a concussion. And so what we did, I have one last um, video that um, demonstrates this. So this is a, uh, one of our concussed athletes and the, the higher colors, the hotter colors, are higher degrees of maximum principal strain that that brain region is experiencing associated with that impact in that individual with their own anatomy, white matter, gray matter, uh, et cetera. So it's a, an individual specific finite element method uh, model. Let me just uh, play that again. And I would call your attention to uh, this uh, area because this will come up again. But they're fairly discrete areas of high maximum principal stress. It's not like the whole brain is lighting up on this. Um, there's very, so if you then say, well, well okay, so um, what if we did it in more than one kid uh, at once? Um, and I have a, a still of that. Um, 
months. And I want to go back and see all the videos again. Um, so here's what what we've done is we've summarized uh, the regions of maximum principal strain in a series of concussed athletes. And uh, what you can see is that um, there are some particular areas within the brain in the concussed group. Uh, that seem to be uh, more exposed to the high levels of maximum principal strain than others. So then we did one, one other step, and that was we said, well, let's um, do DTI imaging uh, preseason, and then let's do it after you're diagnosed with concussion, and let's look at whether this model is any good. Uh, because if it's true, then those areas uh, you would predict are the areas that uh, have increased change in, in white matter. Uh, Indicators, and that's exactly what we found. Very small sample. This is a hard study to do, as you might imagine. Um, but nevertheless, it was a sort of uh, proof of concept. And then you can get even more complicated because it turns out that if you have a white matter track that's going this way, and the direction uh, of the impact is going cross-sectional, you're going to have a completely different uh, impact on the stretch and strain than if it's along the long axis. Uh, of the track as well. So what we've been doing, we, so let me be clear, I don't do this, uh, colleagues who know how to do this are doing this, but um, what, <laughs> what our colleagues are doing are um, taking an individual's white matter topography and then beginning to develop these kind of individual specific uh, maps to take a look at whether we can identify regions that are particularly um, uh, vulnerable. So if we step back for a minute, lots of hits, lots of uh, smoke um, in terms of, well, man, we probably ought to be concerned. Um, but if you say, and, and, and there was a paper from the uh, BU group which came out in NFL players and said, hey, look, um, you know, it turns out that if we look at uh, and retired NFL players and bin them in terms of when their age at first exposure to um, contact sports was, um, the those who started their sport lower than, uh, younger than age 12 um, had higher rates of disexecutive function, um, depression, um, cognitive uh, impairment, and so forth. So a lot was made out of this paper. It was said, well, um, hey, you know, um, the younger you start, the more at risk you are. And that was a big headline. So we decided with our care consortium study of uh, 4,000 athletes, which is um, a, you know, a fairly robust uh, sample, 34 of whom were 3,400 of whom were football players, about 1,000 non-contact. And basically, we said, okay, we've got baseline measures on these people. Let's uh, we have um, um, their report as to when they started their uh, exposure. Absolutely no effect. No effect on current cognition. Um, and in fact. Um, no effect on their symptom scores or anything, whether they started it uh, before age 12 or after age 12. So um, take that for what it is. Um, we did uh, an additional study where we said, well, we really want to get a sense of what these impacts are doing. So this was the work that we did at Dartmouth before I left. Um, and we did the imaging and neurocognitive testing baseline in a group of contact sport athletes and in non-contact sport athletes. And just asked a very sort of seemingly simple question, which is, um, okay, so in the first place, uh, if we get you right before the season starts, before you're hitting your head, are there any differences in the group that's been playing football all their lives or ice hockey or whatever it is uh, cognitively um, to those who are running track or swimmers or what have you? And the second is, we'll test you again at the end of the season, and we'll look to see whether, uh, now this is tricky, it's not that you do worse, because everybody's going to do a little bit better because of practice effects uh, over a three to four month period, but are the contact sport athletes um, improving less than the, um, than the, uh, the non-contact groups? And the short story was that um, we were not able to find any preseason differences uh, whatsoever nor were we able to find any uh, group, significant group differences postseason. We excluded everybody who was diagnosed with a concussion during that season. So this was strictly a kind of what's the effect of repetitive head impacts. And we weren't able to find anything at the front end, and we were unable to find anything initially um, at the back end. Now, we took it a step further, though, and said, well, so is there any relationship at all between measures of head impact exposure 
Um, and basically, there were some modest things. So we looked at uh, how often people got hit, how hard, uh, what was their max hit during the season, and so forth. And they were mildly predictive of how they did on a couple of the cognitive tests, like the CVLT. But it was not dramatic. These were small uh, correlations, but they were uh, statistically significant. So then we said, wow, well, so what's that about then? So then we did, it, we did one further thing. We said, so, you know, maybe some subgroup is getting washed out here um, in, in the group numbers. Maybe there is a group uh, who are really suffering, not suffering, but not doing as well cognitively uh, compared to um, others. So what we did was we arbitrarily said we're going to define, it, it turns out the best predictor of how you're going to do postseason is how you did preseason, right? So um, if you have a large enough sample, you can then predict what your score should be uh, at the end of the season, accounting for practice effect and other sorts of covariates. And so we said uh, we are going to define people who do less, uh, who do worse than one and a half standard deviations below what they were predicted as the worse than predicted group. And we will just simply ask, are there more of those in the contact sport uh, uh, group than in the non-contact? And it turns out uh, the answer was uh, yes. Um, so about one in five uh, of the football players and ice hockey players in that group were in this doing worse than predicted group, whereas about less than 10% in the non-content. So we thought, well, okay, so maybe uh, as a group we're unable to find significant detrimental short-term effects, but might it be that there's a subgroup uh, for whom repetitive head impacts uh, may be um, not good for you? So we took it a step further and uh, we did diffusion uh, diffusion tensor imaging in these groups as well. And I'm running short on time, so I'm going to summarize this. But basically, what we were um, able to determine was that um, there was a, uh, a group uh, interaction in changes in mean diffusivity in the corpus callosum, which we chose in advance because it's an area that's vulnerable to uh, white matter forces and showed up in the, in the other um, area that I talked about um, with the DTI study. Um, and uh, there was a significant main effect, but it was not huge. It was 0.03. Uh, um, but then the measures of head impact exposure correlated with diffusivity measures in several brain uh, regions. And what's more, the group performing lower than one and a half standard deviations, worse than what was predicted, had significantly more change in mean diffusivity in the corpus callosum. So it was hard to ignore it. It was hard to make too much of it. This was not a definitive kind of, um, this is bad for everybody, but again, some ongoing signal that for some people. Um, so where does this leave us? I think what we have to do is move more towards looking at um, uh, additional information about concussion threshold. We have to look at genomic influences uh, on concussion threshold and also the various outcome domains. Um, we are. Um, I'm going to go through these uh, pretty quickly in order to, to finish up, but uh, I've referenced the Concussion Assessment Research and Education Care Consortium. Uh, we now are up to um, 30, uh, 30 schools uh, that are enrolled in part of this, including four of the military service academies uh, that are involved. Uh, this is Steve Broliol and Mike McRae, who are uh, co-PIs uh, on this uh, initiative. Uh, the paradigm is that we, if your school enrolls, then they invite all varsity athletes to be tested baseline preseason uh, across a pretty robust group of measures. Um, and then at five time points subsequent to being identified uh, as injured, uh, up to six months uh, out from the injury. So it's really a study of the acute natural history um, of concussion. We have um, enrolled 40,000 uh, participants over the last four years, and we have a cohort of some 4,000 concussions that we're sort of wading through the data on, so we're hoping to be able to um, answer some of these questions that, um, that we posed during this talk. Um, we have some longitudinal imaging data that will be coming. It's been submitted uh, for um, uh, review. We have blood biomarker data, which is going to be submitted for review uh, in the next several months, and, um, and we will have genomic data on several thousand um, as well. So we're, we're hoping that um, this will begin to address some of the uh, questions that we flagged this morning as 
we're, we don't know enough. Um, and then we've been funded now to uh, pivot from the acute uh, phase of the injury to look at cumulative and persistent uh, effects. So we will be following this cohort out um, across their uh, career. So we've added one more time point. When they graduate, we do all these measures again. And then after they've graduated, we've built an online portal uh, that we will invite people to sign in on and uh, get measures of neurological and psychological health for as long as the funding uh, will allow us uh, to do that. So in summary, um, Concussions of brain injury, uh, in my view, best understood through a neuropsychiatric lens. Um, there seems to be variability in threshold and outcome uh, um, to single and multiple concussions. Some evidence of variability to threshold um, and outcome associated with repetitive head impacts um, as well. And um, what I didn't have time to go into is to always understand the head that is injured. So there are lots of stories where I've seen people who've come in and said they had a concussion. It turned out he had, the, the kid never wanted to play football in the first place, um, and his parents put him in football to toughen him up. Um, and so never, never drop your neuropsychiatric frame for understanding, uh, for understanding people. And I think where I'm sort of landing is, uh, is the right question um, more for whom is hitting your head bad as opposed to this is the worst thing since uh, the Black Plague. But don't know. There's a lot to be concerned about, a lot more to, um, to find out. So thank you. I'll stop there. Yes. Any pearls of wisdom for how to talk to athletes and your parents who have had more than three concussions? Last month on the psych assessment unit, we had a, a Dartmouth lacrosse player who just had his fifth concussion. I wrote a letter to his coach saying, take him off for the rest of the season, but what would you have done? I, I would have done that. I mean, I think the um, by the time you're getting five concussions, and probably if you talk to him in greater detail, you would find this pattern that it's taking less and less of an impact to produce what is then diagnosed as a concussion. And then it's the trajectory of recovery is much longer. And he's already developed, I assume, some sort of acute psychiatric illness associated with that. And, you know, basically, um, it's there are no easy answers to how you talk to the parents because they're invested in how this person is going to be the next, you know, whatever. Um, but um, doing a lot of work with them around, you know, there's more to your life than, than athletics. I mean, I had a soccer player that was the same way. His mother brought him in after going to the five different sports medicine people. Um, and she came in in her fur coat and her this and her that and said, you need to cure this, my son's concussion. And I said, okay, um, and kicked her out and got to talking to uh, him. And he was, um, it didn't take long for him to tell me how depressed he was. He was suicidal. He had an active plan. And uh, once his depression was treated, um, then he was able to actually um, think more clearly about, hey, you know what, I'm never really going to be in the MLS and I'm going to need to sort of adjust to a new me and a new, a new life. It's not an easy answer, but it's, um, it's a realistic one. Thank <laughs> you.